Well, good afternoon. My name is Sarah Doe. I'm the training coordinator for the Foundation Center San Francisco, and I'm joined by my colleague Dave Holmes, based in our Cleveland Library Learning Center, who will be assisting us with any technical and background support. And I really just want to welcome you to our, our webinar today, focused on the art virtual coffee and conversation with the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. Um, and today's session is part of Funding for Arts Month at the Foundation Center, and I really want to say thank you to our Funding for Arts Month sponsor, the James Irvine Foundation. And uh, I also just wanted to share a quick outline uh, of how we'll be spending our time together for the next hour or so. So we will um, uh, meet our speaker, Ben Cameron, from the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, find out about their arts grant-making priorities. We'll take um, questions um, from the audience for Ben um, after his presentation. And then we will take just a very quick um, spin and demonstration using the Foundation Director Online to really highlight how to research even more potential arts funders. Um, and then we'll wrap up. Um, in terms of some housekeeping things using this platform, you can download the handouts, including the slide presentation, in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. And then, as I mentioned, you can input questions at any time for our speaker um, into the Q&A chat box, and then those will be moderated um, about halfway through the hour. So I suspect that some of you uh, joining us today may be new to the Foundation Center and our work. Um, as a reminder, the Foundation Center is a national nonprofit organization, and our mission is really to strengthen the social sector by advancing knowledge about philanthropy in the United States and around the world. One way we accomplish our mission is through educating thousands of people each year through a full curriculum of training courses, both in the classroom and here online. Uh, we offer free and affordable classes that cover the funding research process, proposal writing, grant makers and their giving, lots of related topics. And some of you may be familiar with our comprehensive um, grant-seeking training tool, the Foundation Directory Online. Uh, again, more about that tool later. Um, and uh, towards the end of our session, we'll, I'll do a quick demonstration on how to find arts funders like the Doris Charitable Foundation. Another way we accomplish our mission is through connecting nonprofits to the resources that you really need to thrive. That is through our free online portal, GrantSpace, grantspace.org. And this webinar was only available to GrantSpace members like you, so we really encourage you to explore GrantSpace, particularly the Arts and Culture resource page, and I have the link there on the screen. Uh, and of course, you can find more related resources um, uh, as well as Funding for Arts Month webinars. In fact, two coming up, one on October 25th um, on recent trends and future prospects for arts and culture funding. That's free and that's at 10 a.m. Pacific time and 1 o'clock Eastern time. And then uh, how to apply to creative capital. That's Monday, October 28th, uh, also 1 o'clock Pacific time, 4 o'clock Eastern time. And you can find out all of those details on grantspace.org. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming today's guest speaker, Ben Cameron. Uh, he is the Program Director for the Arts at the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, and he assumed his current position as Program Director for the Arts in 2006. Um, in that capacity, he supervises uh, a $13 million grants program focusing on organizations and artists in the theater, contemporary dance, jazz, and presenting fields. Um, before that, he served for more than eight years as the Executive Director of Theater Communications Group, uh, commonly referred to as TCG, uh, which is the National Service Organization for the American Nonprofit Professional Theater, um, expanding its programs, membership-based, grant-making activities. Uh, just He's done so much for the arts community, and uh, I just really want you to help me and join me in welcoming Ben. Take it away, Ben. Thank, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here and honored to be asked to do this. Uh, as for those of you that are, are on the call, uh, I was asked to both explain a little bit about the Doris Duke Charitable Arts Foundation giving program, but also to demystify the whole philanthropic process and how philanthropists think. So this presentation is sort of a combination of the 30,000-foot view and the weeds. So I hope that it's uh, informative, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, the Doris Duke Charitable Arts giving effort is actually the, the, the combination of three different kinds of pots of money, all three of which fall under my supervision. The Doris Duke Charitable Foundation 
Foundation Arts Program, which is first, which again is $13 million a year. The Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art, uh, which is about a $2 million a year appropriation, and a special one-time allocation that the board made to us two years ago, which is an additional $50 million above and beyond the other two pots of money primarily designed to benefit artists, each which I'll talk about in turn. Two directives from Doris Duke really inform our work here that come up in her will. First of all, in the will, it says the foundation to be established in her name must have a scientific and artistic purpose. Not may have, not scientific or artistic, but must have a scientific and artistic purpose. And as just a preface to this, I am acutely aware that I'm given as a result a great deal of liberty and permission to think about things that if I were, like many of my colleagues, forced to annually justify why the art should be funded at all, we might be thinking in very different ways. So we're, we're blessed here to have that assurance of perpetuity. Additionally, the, the will also says that we should support actors, singers, dancers, and musicians in the public performance and presentation of their work. A directive that when the board interpreted said, we should invest in professional artists in jazz, contemporary dance, and theater, and the organizations who nurture, present, and produce those artists. Those being the three forms that Doris cared about most passionately during her own life. So again, as a preface, we do not fund museums in the arts program proper, or orchestras, or operas, or literature. It is jazz, contemporary dance, and theater, and organizations who present, produce, or nurture those artists. In addition, the board has three sort of values they urge us to uphold. First of all, that we are national in scope, meaning that an artist or an organization from anywhere in the country can knock on our doors. That we are what we consider equitable in approach, meaning that anyone asking us for money should be on a level playing field or have the same opportunity to ask if they meet our guidelines. And that we should not advantage an organization just because they're in New York and we might see their work or because they could afford the, afford the plane fare to get to our offices to meet with us in person. And at the same time, that as a staff, we should be lean. Indeed, in all of the arts program combined, there are only four of us who work together to coordinate these efforts, including a largely clerical and administrative position. So we're a tight organization. Given that just with these three fields, there are more than 10,000 organizations nationwide that could knock on our door, plus multiples of that in terms of artists, we, by definition now, in order to be national and equitable, work primarily through intermediaries or re-granting programs who in turn distribute our money through peer panel programs that are open for competition, but peer panels ultimately decide who gets the money. Now, even with this, we have a lot of questions about, so what should we give money to support? And in defining our strategy at the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, we go through a number of steps. First of all, we support field meetings through national uh, service organizations to convene artists, administrators, and technicians to tell us what their fields most urgently need. We support distribution of field surveys that extend that reach even further to individual artists and to others who could not attend the meetings. We monitor industry publications like uh, American Theatre Magazine, the Dance USA Newsletter, et cetera, as well as the annual reports of the fiscal health of the fields. At each of our panel meetings where we do give away money, we have extensive policy discussions where we get additional information about the field needs and how well our programs are doing, all of which leads our staff to a proposal of what we should give to, which then we convene experts that we informally call the wise persons to review, all of which precede our presenting a potential strategy to our board for endorsement that will guide us for a five-year arc of giving. Our current strategy, which was begun in 2006 and renewed, or, or begun in 2007, sorry, and renewed by the board in 2012, came out of each of those things. And in the field meetings, which began this process, where we convened more than 700 artists, managers, and technicians in 22 meetings in 14 cities, we heard three kinds of issues in our fields. First of all, we heard what we called idiosyncratic issues. Every field has fee issues that it cares about and it cares about alone that are particularly important. In dance, for example, there's career transition. Dancers who are trained to dance and at the age of 30 or 32 or 35 find that their knees are going, their backs are going out. They are facing their adult 
adult life unable to do the only thing they've ever been able to train to do. That's an enormous issue in dance, but simply doesn't resonate in jazz, for example, where the issue we heard most heavily was the upheaval in music distribution, the decline of jazz radio, the end of tower records, the disintegration of the road. Again, issues important to jazz which didn't resonate in theater, where in theater we heard about language barriers and defection to all commercial alternatives as playwrights especially were drawn to Broadway or television or movies, et cetera, but idiosyncratic issues. Second kind of issues we heard were what we call chronic issues, issues that are critically important in our field, but we call chronic because the people of my age heard these same issues 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and more. Those issues primarily being issues of undercapitalization, that arts organizations simply lack the necessary resources to execute everything on their plate, and issues additionally of undercompensation, meaning that arts professionals typically fail in comparison to their for-profit counterparts and that we woefully undercompensate the people that work in the arts. I hope that uh, if you ever hear me in a meeting and I don't say this, you'll call me to task. We frequently say that while we talk in philanthropy about government philanthropy, corporate philanthropy, individual philanthropy, and more, in the arts, the biggest charitable sector of all is the artists, the managers, and technicians on whose lives the work is made by virtue of inadequate compensation, lack of health care benefits, lack of competitive vacation, and more. But again, our industry may be predicated on discounted labor, and this is a chronic issue for our field. However, we heard four issues that we thought cut across all our fields that we didn't hear 20 years ago and that had special power to impact the health of the arts going forward. And these very quickly were, first of all, the breakdown of the 501c3 model. As especially managers were saying to us, I went into this business because I love the arts. Now my life is about board development. It's about school board policy. It's about fundraising. It's about a host of things that prevent me from participating meaningfully in the arts life of my organization. This system is breaking down, and isn't there another way to fund the work we feel called to do? Secondly, we heard issues about change in demographics as our country's national profile changes, changes that on the one hand promise us thrilling new opportunities in terms of cross-fertilization of culture and new cultural expression, but on the other hand, we have to admit, are threatening what had been a presumed allegiance to traditionally Eurocentric form. We heard about audience erosion and changes in audience behavior. These are much longer discussions, of course, as you know, but decline of subscription sales, decline of single ticket sales, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, um, uh, longer story. And fourth and finally, the impact of technology, certainly not unrelated, impact of technology both as our primary form of competition, as a redefiner of consumer expectations, leading to expectations of personalization, customization, and convenience that we simply cannot meet. And finally, changes in cultural economics to really shorthand that to say, what's it going to mean when we say to somebody that's $100 for a symphony, opera, theater, or ballet ticket when young people are used to downloading culture on demand 24-7 for 99 cents a song or for free? These cross-field millennium issues were particularly powerful to us, and we had the choice. We could have said, let's build our strategy around the idiosyncratic issues and do something unique for every field. We could have said, let's make our strategy around the chronic issues and try to get it on capitalization and undercompensation. But with our board's encouragement, we began to say, how is it that we begin to address these cross-field millennium issues of change that will determine the ultimate viability of the health of the arts moving forward in this country? Our strategy, therefore, in the arts program proper, which again is $13.125 million, is composed of three kind of concentric circles. At the center in this yellow circle is what we call creation and presentation of new work. And I'm going to, I'll break these down uh, a little bit more in, in, as we go. But creation and presentation literally means for us we spend anywhere from 35 to 50 percent of our budget in a given year to support artists to create new work, to support organizations to commission new work, and to help that work be toured or presented around the country and produced. The blue circle, if we say basically at the center we, we have, uh, uh, we're, we're having new work, 
outside in the, the lighter blue circle, we're beginning to ask the question, how do we strengthen organizations? How do we help organizations be thoughtful and respond to these issues that we addressed earlier? How can we encourage organizations to begin to address these issues of changing demographics, audience changes in behavior, and the competition from technology? And then as a national foundation, we spend anywhere from 15 to 25 percent of our budget in a given year on what we call building the national sector. A question that really comes from the difference between, is there a difference between 100 strong dance companies and a strong dance field? What would the difference between those two things be? And through building the national sector, we support national organizations critical to the health of our field and discrete national projects that could advance the health of those fields. To break this out a little more, in essence, what we're trying to do in a concentric way is to say, at the center, we're looking to build and develop stronger artists who will be served and produced at stronger organizations and part of the larger, stronger fields. In creation and presentation of new work, remembering that this goes through our intermediary program, again, we're supporting commissions, tourings, residents, and general operating. And we do that primarily through five discrete programs that we support. Chamber Music America's New Works program, which supports commissions of jazz composers. Creative Capital Grants, which support artists to make new project work in all three of those fields, jazz, dance, and theater. The MAP or Multidiscipline Arts for, uh, the MAP Fund, Multidisciplinary Arts Pro Production Fund, again addressing all three of our fields. The National Dance Project, which supports new works created in dance and touring of dance nationwide, and the NPN or the National Performance Network Fund, uh, also the Creation Fund to commission new work in each of our fields. For organizations, uh, we. Uh, I'm getting the same click. Uh, uh, whoops, those are just highlights. In organizational transformation, our strategy has really been around two primary ideas. How do we help organizations innovate and test new ways of behavior? And how is it we help them think about developing their long-term adaptive capacity? When the arts economy turned in 2008 and our budget took a big hit, we asked ourselves additionally the question of, if these are organizations so critical to the field, should we be investing in them in a different way uh, than simply supporting them with project grants? not having the capacity to necessarily enter into long-term relationships with organizations for general operating. We did make the decision, however, that as an earmark of our grants going forward for organizations, all project grants that we support carry additional general operating support grants as complements to the project grant, meaning that typically if we gave you $100,000, for example, to create and tour a new work, you would receive anywhere from twenty-five dollars to $30,000 additionally of general operating support for your organization for the duration of your grant period. These programs are supported primarily through uh, several regranting programs as well. The Arts Presenters Creative Campus Grant, which supports attempts on university campuses to position the arts in new ways. Dance USA's Engaging Dance Audiences program, which supports new attempts to develop dance audiences at dance organizations around the country. The EMC Arts Innovation Lab program, which is open to jazz organizations, presenters, theaters, and dance companies to test innovative new practices, primarily but not exclusively around audience development. And TCG's Theater Revolution, again, asking the question of how we build demand for theater audiences going forward. Finally, the building the national sector, which again is trying to build national fields as opposed to just nationally strong organizations, is comprised of two discrete areas, project discrete support and complementary general operating support. And we do this through two, uh, two initiatives. The Fund for National Projects offers grants of between $60,000 and $200,000 to support projects that will expand the possible services, activities, and opportunities for the field. This does not support ongoing national conferences. This does not support annual research. This supports new projects, new attempts to expand what is already out there. So if, for example, you're applying to start a leadership program, you can't just be leadership program number 51. You have to be able to demonstrate why your perspective, your faculty, your expertise affords a different kind of training than the array of programs that are already out there. Complementing that is what we call the core support for national organizations, which is our way to support 
the annual conferences, the annual publications, the annual researches that are already out there and that bind a field together and that all too often are underfunded. Those three issue, those three groups, sorry, I'm going to go back. These three programs, again, represent the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation Arts Program proper, totaling $13.125 million a year. The second pot of money, the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art, has a very simple mission, to support American understanding of Islam and Muslim cultures through the arts, a very different focus than the arts program proper has, and one that has uh, a wider discipline purview. The Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art, which is a $2 million a year budget, we do accept applications from museums, we do accept visual arts applications, we do accept film applications and more. The discipline restrictions which in the will are levied onto the arts program proper are not levied to the Islamic Arts Foundation, which gives us a different kind of range of possibilities. With all of that said, we've just hired our first senior program officer full-time in the program. This is now embarking on a strategic review, and the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art will be announcing its strategic outlay of programs at some point in 2014. So all I can really tell you about uh, what we call DDFIA for Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art is to stay tuned, and within the next 12 months, the array of how you can apply and what we're supporting should be clear. The third and final pot of money is what we call the special allocation. The special allocation really stemmed in from two different kind of impulses, and these are uh, primarily uh, around artists. Um, a number of years ago when I first came here, I had a conversation with two artists who came into the office and said, we're deeply appreciative of all the commissioning work we've gotten from you. We, we love the fact that we are supported through the National Dance Project, but as people who have been doing this for a long time, do we ever get get off the treadmill, uh, that if you're an artist, you make a project so you can get money, you haven't even finished that first project, uh, and you're already having to dream up another project for more money. The first grant probably doesn't pay for all your production needs. What about all the needs, no project supports, et cetera? What is it that we should be doing to help those kinds of organizations and artists go forward? When we got a new president in 2009, he began his tenure here by saying to the board, you, in past years, did special additional allocations for medical. You did one for environment. Would you entertain a conversation to doing a special one-time allocation for the arts? The board, God bless them, said we would love to have that discussion. And a year and a half later, we emerged with these three interlocking programs, the Doris Duke Artist, the Doris Duke Artistic Impact Awards, and the Doris Duke Building Demand Grants. Doris Duke Artist Grants offer $225,000 in unrestricted, I don't know if these are, uh, oops, sorry, I didn't know if they had animated or not. The Doris Duke Artists offer $225,000 in unrestricted funding to artists that artists can choose to take over three, four, or five years. In addition to that $225,000, the artist is entitled, should she or he wish it, to have an additional $25,000 to help them think about their audience or community connection, uh, a, a pot of money they could use to design a website or to hire consultants, to do research, to hold after-performance salons, but rather than thinking about their own needs as individuals, to think about the needs of how they connect with their organizations. In addition, recognizing that artists frequently continue and don't retire, and that their income slackens in their later years, for artists who have shown evidence of planning for their retirement during their grant period, by putting aside money in 401ks or individual retirement accounts or whatever, those artists are entitled to an additional $25,000 in further unrestricted support, making the total value of Doris Duke Artist Award grants $275,000. These awards are not open from app for application. Eligibility is determined by having received at least uh, support from national sources from at least three different projects over a decade. So if you're a dance artist and you've had three different dances supported from national sources over a decade, you're automatically eligible for consideration. One of those, one of those national sources, though, has to have been Duke. 
The Doris Duke Artistic Impact Award grant has the same objectives, but recognizes that there is an emerging pool of artists that don't have the visibility or don't have the track record of the artists that were in the first pot of money. The first class of Doris Duke Artists, which are Impact Award winners, which are now being selected, will be announced in 2014. Those grants are similarly structured, uh, structured but are smaller amounts and shorter time periods. So those artists will receive $60,000 in unrestricted support, an additional $20,000 to support their audience, I'm sorry, an additional $10,000 to support their audience connection, and an additional $10,000 to help them meet retirement needs if indeed that they are, um, uh, have shown evidence of planning for their retirement. These award recipients will be based on anonymous nominations from a panel of distinguished artists. Third and finally, we have the Doris Duke Building Demand Grants, which supports artists in residence at arts organizations to work together to imagine new ways that we can work together to build audience demand. You know, one of the things we were struck by in recent publications was how typically we're often locked in a kind of fractious labor dynamic of, of playwrights, for example, saying, when are you going to produce more of my work? And theaters saying, when are you going to write a play I can produce? And we just wanted to say, rather than being in this adversarial position, can we come together to imagine how do we work together in new ways to build that demand so that we will have the audiences who want to see this kind of new work? In these particular programs, artists spend roughly four months over a, th of, over a period of up to three years. That could be four months in a row. It could be a week here, a week there, but a total of uh, 120 days over a four-year period. Grants are $150,000 at the large end to support this kind of residency activity from the artist, and the artist automatically gets half of that grant amount, so $75,000 of the $150,000 compensates the artist for their time in this building demand program. With that, I think that's probably the fastest fly through you've had through 30,000 feet and weeds in a long time, because I tend to talk fast, but that's a quick overview of our program, both philosophically and logistically. And I'm happy to answer or say anything about anything. So Sarah, I'm going back to you. All right. Wow. Yes. You weren't kidding. 30,000 foot view and we got some weeds. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ben. Sure. Um, as a reminder, please submit your questions to Ben uh, in the Q&A text box. And I just want to um, start us off with a few more specific questions, if you wouldn't mind. No. Are there any upcoming deadlines or kind of scheduled announcements that today's attendees should be made aware of? Uh, all of our deadlines, are, uh, the easiest way to sort of uh, uh, look at these is through our um, uh, website, uh, www.ddcf.org, which links you to all of our programs. And all of the intermediaries have their own deadlines. We administer really only three programs directly from this office. Number one, the Fund for National Projects, which I mentioned before. Uh, I know for a lot of individual organizations that can seem overwhelming, and we're certainly not urging you to undertake a national project because these projects have to be national in scope. That said, we have had consortia of organizations compete successfully in this in the past. There were 12 jazz presenters, including SF Jazz, for example, Jazz at Lincoln Center, Cleveland Arts Group, uh, or Cleveland Jazz Group in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and others, who said, the 12 of us don't understand how people become a jazz audience. Let's hire a researcher and let's work together to do that. Similarly, 12 presenters came together and formed the Africa Consortium to explore how do we have equitable dance with the dance continent, African continent, and more. If you're interested in that program, that program begins with a preliminary letter of intent, which is less than two pages long, which is due at the end of February 2014. A preliminary panel reviews the letters. They invite roughly the 20 to 25 most competitive preliminaries to submit full applications, which are due roughly six weeks later. The panel tends to meet in early June. The grants are tend to be announced end of June or early July. So that's program number one we administer. Program number two, the residency program that I mentioned before, is on an 18-month cycle. And we are currently in the process where the applications are already in-house. Uh, and so the panel is going to meet in November. So the next application for those residency grants will not be until 2015. And that, that process will unroll in, I think it's February of 2015. Uh, the other program that we have, which is the 
general support for national organizations supporting annual conferences, et cetera, is on a biennial cycle. Those grants have already been announced for this year and will not be renewed or, or that competition won't reopen again until 2015 as well. So that's their cycle. Uh, other programs tend to, and I'm saying tend to, so this isn't an absolute, tend to have February-ish start dates. Uh, for the for the process rolling forward. So I would say if any of this is of appealing to you, I would get on the, the website right away to think about this. The earliest uh, batch that starts even before that are the two programs, the MAP Fund and the Creative Capital Foundation programs, and they're, they're in the application phase right now. So I, I'd, I'd get cracking if those things are, are of use. Mm -hmm. Get it on the website, and I did post it there. It's ddcf.org. And I understand that, you know, obviously some of these programs are for organizations. Um, some of them are for individual artists. Um, in general, what are, what's some advice you have for organizations or individuals making their first approach to you? Um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, it, it's pretty easy. One is do your homework uh, uh, in terms of making sure there's a fit. You know, we are very clear, I hope, about the things we do and don't fund, and you'll find that on our website. There are a number of things. We, we do not fund endowments. We do not fund bricks and mortar. We do not fund as a discrete program arts education, although if you can justify that as a form of audience development, you might be able to make a case in one of those regranting programs in that line. But we're pretty clear about the things that fall outside our purview. Uh, and additionally, I hope we're very clear about the discipline. So, you know, if, if, with all due respect, if you're uh, a major uh, symphony, and I love symphonies, it's not a good use of your time or of ours for you to knock on our door because we only support jazz in terms of music. So number one, do your homework. Uh, number two, uh, I would say that where, where I see grants fall apart most frequently at peer panel reviews, one of three things tends to happen most often. Number one, an organization speaks in grantmanship speak in ways that have have a tendency to sort of erase or efface the idea, the individuality of the organization. Um, uh, I think the most successful applications speak with an authentic voice. They speak with a deliberate personal voice, and the more you hear from artists, even in an organizational context the better advantaged you are, and especially in those programs where we ask for a, a statement from the artistic director, there is a very different reaction from panels when, an art, when you hear an artist speak and when it's pretty clear that the development office has written that statement on behalf of the artist. Panels, because they are artists themselves and because they do come from the arts field themselves, tend to sniff out that difference pretty fast, and it does have enormous impact. Uh, I would say the second in place the organizations fall apart is where, in an attempt to be competitive, they overreach. You know, we see a lot of applicants who will say, we are the only theater in America that supports children to be here with their parents. And, and a panelist will say, that's not true. I can name 10 others who do that. We're the only dance company that tours to the Midwest. Well, that's not true. We can name one false statement of that kind of scope then throws everything else into the application under a cloud of suspicion and leads to dismissal. So a kind of understandable tendency to want to self-aggrandize or kind of establish one's uniqueness is a minefield if you are not 100% that the statement you are submitting in that kind of terrain is accurate. The third piece, in most programs, we know we're in the uh, – um, the delicate position, given what we do around national funding and asking for the kind of projects that we do, that we can't necessarily expect that all of the money necessary to do the project will be secured. Uh, so in the Fund for National Projects, we will fund up to 40% of the project cost, but we won't fund 100%. And part of the budget says, where's the rest of the money coming from? Uh, I think what we recognize is we're often the first in, and having our name on a project may stimulate other people to give, so we don't necessarily expect to see all that money secured. What panelists will look at is, is there a viable list of potential other donors 
conceived of in a rational and appropriate way that could provide the balance if called on. And again, where applications tend to fall aside are where people clearly essentially haven't done the work necessary to figure that out. Meaning, if somebody says, well, you know, you're going to give us $40,000, we are going to get the other $60,000 from Target stores. If you've ever had a history of with Target stores, you know Target stores grants are typically between $1,000 or $3,000. And a panel will say, Target, Target doesn't even give $60,000 grants for this. If they don't even realize that, again, it throws everything else under suspicion. So it's really about that kind of detailed conception about trying to work out as much of that as possible with a realistic sensibility about what is achievable. Uh, and then the last thing I would say is for us, and we try to be clear about this, we're also very clear that in our programs we're going to give you what you ask for or we're going to give you nothing. Uh, we don't play the games about ask us for 100 because you think we'll give you 50 and therefore overinflate your budgets. So if you're asking for 100, you're telling us you need 100 and we should give you 100 or nothing because we don't want to compound your lives. So overinflated costs, uh, fictitious costs uh, on the one hand can, can come back to bite you. On the other hand, at the other end, under budgeting can also come back to bite you in a very different way. You know, a panel of arts experts will say they want to hold a national conference and they're saying that's going to cost them $12,000. It can't be done. So a lack of, while I understand the impulse, a kind of trying to second guess somebody in your budget will not serve you in our programs. You need to tell us what is real and, and only what is real. Does that wow. make sense? Yes, absolutely. Sound advice, for, again, for organizationally and for individuals. Um, and I would also say just sound advice for not just the arts sector, but for all of the other sectors as well. Fantastic. Thanks for those tips. Sure. Um, I'm going to start fielding questions from uh, our audience. And Elizabeth's saying, you know, many cities host a mid-level type artist who has devoted a lifetime to producing work but never broken through to a national grant or, or audience. Is there a program to support these kind of quote-unquote workhorses? You know, I, I'm always curious about that uh, in terms of uh, when people haven't broken through, what the reason for that is. Uh, uh, and, and I'm sure Elizabeth would be able to tell me better than I. What we often see are two things. Uh, sometimes at national programs, you do see artists from regions or locations break through to grants that nobody's been aware of because of the quality of their work. Uh, a lot of what we do encourage uh, in most of our grant programs is submission of work samples. And so the panel is looking at the work as a primary determinant. And regionally, um, it, it is true that, that uh, um, the, the quality of the work sample will often trump reputation. It's the, rare, it's, it's the rare grant panel where I think we walk away having heard of everybody who got this before the panel started. That said, I have to also say we are deeply pressed to get applications from all over the country. I mean, especially, and this pains me as a North Carolinian, and I know there's a Durham person on here to say, we have entire initiatives where we, have, where we never in a given year get applications from uh, uh, the southern states. Or, you know, all of the applications either come from the, 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 the northeast, the coast, or a few spots in between, like Chicago, Minneapolis, a few other key places. I don't know if that's because we don't have the word out. I don't know if that's because people are self-censoring because they believe they won't be nationally competitive. But one of the reasons that regionally we don't see a broader spread is New York artists, even though they tend to be dominant our programs, actually get a lower percentage of the grants than their numbers are in the applicant pool. It's just we're pressed in terms of reaching the applicants at a different kind of level. Uh, we do not sponsor regional programs. There are programs that do, however, depending on the field. The National Dance Project does have an initiative called RDDI, which is deliberately designed to go into a region to work with regional artists, help them develop better work samples, help them gain some confidence, walk them through those programs, et cetera. And those artists have really flourished in the national context. If you look at our nas last National Dance Project grant roster, four of the 12 companies that got grants came from Minnesota, which was a product of an, uh, of an RDI. 
Additionally, what I'd finally say is, all of our grants programs are also charged with counseling applicants before applications are due. And so what we really encourage people to do is to call the MAP program, to call Creative Capital, to call National Dance Project, to participate in the webinars, which frequently many of the uh, uh, intermediaries hold, to walk people through how to apply, what do you need to do, how do you put together a competitive work packet, et cetera. We're hopeful that demystifying the process will lead to a different kind of configuration of grantees. But again, being national, we don't do that. And, and finally, I will also say, I think our board zealously guards that national position right now. When I started in the arts field, there were probably 20 or 30 foundations that you could apply to no matter where you lived in the country for arts. And now there are probably closer to half a dozen. And our board recognizing that they are national foundations are an endangered species, as it were, that there are so few of us and that our resources, even though they sound huge, really aren't that big for a nation's uh, uh, total needs, really protects that national position and just isn't thinking regionally or locally at this point. Great point. And um, thank you for your question, Elizabeth. Sure. Um, I, I just want to point out in terms of kind of demystifying the process again, you know, the, the Foundation Center is a big part of our job is to really help grant seekers do their homework. And um, again, I just want to plug the How to Apply to the Creative Work Fund, uh, excuse me, How to Apply to Creative Capital uh, webinar coming up on Monday, October 28th at 1 o'clock Pacific time or 4 o'clock Eastern time. Susan's wondering, is there a way for an arts organization to approach DDCF if its mission fits within these DDCF's guidelines? but does not fit within one of the DDCF arts grant programs? There's really not. Uh, unfortunately, you know, our, 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 uh, we, again, we just don't have the staff, nor do we have the resources here. Uh, the, the, um, our board really charges us with having strategic priorities, and we hope within those priorities all the fields are eligible, and, and there are a number of programs within that. The, the only thing, and this is a buck 95, and I literally mean a buck 95 in terms of uh, uh, really ample money. There is a very small pot of money additionally that if a project crosses multiple program areas of the foundation, we can apply to. We have a medical research program and we have an environmental stewardship program around climate change and preservation of, of environment. If a program can make a deep case in both fields, or in multiple fields, they can apply directly to us by sending me a letter to start that process. It is a very seldom and rare thing, but I will say, for example, we have supported medical uh, uh, musicians to be in residence at a medical school at the University of Michigan to train medical students in how to listen differently as an example of something that the medical field cared about and we cared about. That said, both programs have to care equally and passionately about a project. So. I'm just warning people, if you send me a great arts project and I can't rouse similar enthusiasm from the environment or the medical program, then there's really nothing I can do. Otherwise, you have to go through the, either the re-granting programs or come to us through that Fund for National Project or the residency program I mentioned earlier. All right. Fantastic. Again, thanks for your question. Susan. Sure. And Michael's, uh, Michael Stevens, we have a few Michaels, is asking, yeah. you know, we're, we're a small theater company that features commission plays that are cast with a hybrid artist combination of professional and amateur actors, directors, designers, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, is this something that the EMC Innovations Lab would be interested in? Uh, it could be. Uh, the Innovations Lab program is really what, well, two things. One is, I'd say to the, to the theater, first of all, they do qualify, for, I would think, for a lot of our commissioning program and some of our artistic work. And some of those programs are, are uh, uh, some of those theaters are, are very small who have gotten that kind of money. Uh, they may even be a member of National Performance Network. Again, a lot of those groups are very small. And in our residency program, there are two tier levels of grants, one deliberately designed for smaller arts organizations, so those grants are smaller. Uh, primarily because we recognize that grants of $75,000 to artists can distort a theater's pay schedule even within its own ranks. But there, we, we want to be sensitive to the, the, the size dimension. Um, uh, that said, the Innovations uh, Program, which, is, uh, uh, which we'll be announcing the next iteration of at some point next year, is really designed not to be around artistic innovation. It's primarily to be designed to be around organizational innovation, to say basically we have an idea about how we 
we want to behave differently as an organization, how we want to develop an audience, how we want to use technology, some business or management or organizational dimension. And we have what's called a half-baked idea. So we know more than, gee, we need to get on the Internet, but we're not so far down the line that we've already identified the software we need in the server. We're somewhere in the fuzzy middle. What that program typically has done has offered a year of professional consulting and advice and faculty to that program. There is a mandatory five-day retreat where we take a team of up to 10 people, including staff, board, and outsiders from an organization to go away and really plan on what this business innovation would be. And it's a totally transformative experience. It's the most enthusiastically part received of the whole program. And even though people say, I can't do it, you know, it's too much time, but it's everybody who's done it just says it changed their lives. Uh, and then there's a, a grant of roughly $30,000 to launch the innovation in cash, plus a, a general operating support grant of another $10,000 on top of that. So cash value, $4,000. Consulting and retreat value is another sixty to seventy. So total value of the grant is about $110,000, $115,000. But that is quite open to uh, uh, hybrid groups. Again, the project's more around programmatic you know, business model innovation more than it is around artistic innovation. Great clarification. Um, and I'm really realizing just how many programs you you have just within the arts. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's exhausting. <laughs> no, we're very lucky. Indeed. Um, another question from another Michael. How do uh, DDCF commissioning initiatives build new audiences and start to build a positive dynamic in the performing arts? Oh, God, all the Michaels, let's just sit back, let's put our feet up and have a long conversation yeah. on that. Warm up your um, coffee. Yeah, there are a couple things. Number one, some of the Innovations Lab program have supported new ways to develop audiences, and those have been quite far-reaching. Among some of the successful ones we've seen have been attempts to use technology to reach audiences in new ways. Uh, we've supported, for example, a thing at the Wooster Group called the Dailies, which is the posting of a one to two minute video every day, a new video on the Wooster Group website. Uh, what they have found in that, some days it's a rehearsal clip, some days it's an archival clip, some day it's their lead actress banging on the bathroom door and saying, get the hell out of the bathroom, I've got to get in there. I mean, you never know what you're going to encounter. But it's kind of a demystification of the organization. They have an audience of more than 30,000 people who visit the site at least 20 times a month. It was central to their work around their most recent project in New York where their earned income went up 40% and their marketing costs went down 20%. So they're reaching people through technology in a huge way. At the same time, we've supported the Walker Art Center uh, to develop, to try to, to coordinate salons of people to talk to each other after performances led by non-arts professionals. This is a, a larger, long, larger topic about the desire of audiences to know how to talk about the work with each other rather than be lectured to by a dramaturg. And we've supported opportunities for people to socialize either before or after performances to develop and expand that kind of framework. So there's a huge range of these kinds of programs around building demand. I, I think uh, if we're going to have a long talk about this, you'll see some of it reflected in the uh, materials if you looked at our building demand guidelines because some of the presumptions around are you looking to, to, to broaden your audience, meaning are you going to get more people like the ones who already come to come? Uh, do you want to deepen your audience? Do you, are you just trying to get the people who already come to come more? Do you want to diversify your audience? Does that mean really what you're trying to do is get a different kind of person to come in the door? Because those are three very different challenges and require three different kinds of solutions. And what we're seeing people experiment with is relationship innovations, venue innovations, program innovations, and financial innovations. So we've supported attempts on all four levels. But all four of those things are very different. I think what you're beginning to see in our guidelines as a result of this is our own search for a vocabulary around this. So our own guidelines don't refer to audience development. They refer to audience slash community slash market because we want to sort of explode the box about thinking it's only about getting somebody in to watch a show. And we're really sort of stimulated right now by a, an artist who was in a meeting recently who said, we can't think of it anymore as, audience development, we need to think of it as intentional community design. Uh, 
which I thought was a provocative way to sort of say, you know, there are times you need a community of people to watch a show, but there may be another times you need a community of people to help you make a show, or you may need a community of people to be uh, participants in, in an array of events. Depending on what the needs of the event are, the community may need to be designed in a different way. Uh, uh, since the question, I think, came from a, a, a Michael Theater, unless I'm now conflating my questions, uh, I, I will say we've been really interested in the work at Woolly Mammoth, which we've also supported in their connectivity program, where they begin now by sitting down a playwright, because they do new plays, and they begin that process by saying, okay, you've written a play. Who has to be in the audience for this play to fully come alive? If this play is going to reach its fullest potential, who has to be here? Not who might want a ticket, not who might be interested. Who's got to be here? And they actually tell a fantastic story about about uh, working with a playwright who wrote a play about African-American drag queens. And they sat him down and said, who has to be here? And he said, African-American clergymen. And whereas they said that wasn't, the, that wasn't the answer we expected, when we went after that market, boy, that play combusted in ways we never could have imagined. And so this new animated way of saying what's the audience's active, necessary involvement in an event, rather than looking at the audience as a passive target for marketing, has really changed how that organization behaves and is leading to a new kind of audience demand building in that configuration. So again, a much, much more long and extensive conversation. If you do go to our website, you will see uh, we always post uh, assessments of all our programs, and we do surveys or, or research, like we did with the Jazz Consortium, about what are the factors that go into developing a jazz audience. We link to those studies as well, so you may find either links or a kind of useful batch of reports on our website that will help answer some of those questions. Wow, fantastic. Thank you for sharing those examples, Ben. Really, really amazing. Um, this is our, the last question that we can take. Um, from Matthew. Uh, he's asking, can you talk some more about the breakdown of the 501c3 model and, and what successful measures you've seen arts organizations take in response to it? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think bottom line is uh, uh, as the, as the, as two things have happened simultaneously, as the complexity of what it means to run an arts organization has exponentially increased with time and as the traditional reliance on funding structures have deteriorated, the stress on organizations has grown, meaning for better or for worse, for many years, performing arts organizations in America had a very healthy run based on subscription models. And that typically your cash flow was provided, you had a loyal audience, all of this through the idea of subscription. Now, for reasons totally divorced from the arts, people's lives work at different rhythms, people's uh, income works at different levels, people's opportunities of choice work at different levels, and the plausibility of saying to a young person, please commit now and send me money to be in a seat for me on February 15th of 2015 is a laughable proposition. In these meetings, what we heard from managers, people were people just said literally to us, you know, I went into this business because I, I loved jazz. You know, I, 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 if I wanted to run a big business, I would have gone to work on Wall Street, but I went into this business because I love jazz. And now my daily life is about trying to find somebody to sit on my board. My daily life is about going down to the school board and lobbying to keep music in the schools. My daily life is about arguing with the editor of the newspaper to not cut the arts coverage. My daily, And as a result, I go for months at a time, and I've never put my foot in a rehearsal hall. I go for months at a time, and I see artists coming out of my building. I don't even know their names. Something is wrong with this, and isn't there a different way to finance the work we feel called to do? What we're beginning to see, you know, on the one hand, we it's a compelling argument, and we hear it in all the fields, this sense of increasing stress on a, on a model that by necessity may be breaking down. Because our Doris Dukes Will says we can only fund 501c3s, we are to some degree constrained in what we can do directly for that. I mean, we, we cannot fund LLCs directly. We do give support to artists or to collectives who don't want to incorporate but nonetheless have fiscal sponsors or fiscal agents. So we do accept that as a way of supporting alternatives to this. Interestingly enough, there's now an emergence of a kind of pattern of funding. Uh, somebody else on the call will know the name of this. I'm just blanking on it for a minute. But the example given at conferences is uh, 
uh, uh, uh, for example, um, uh, a, a, a government, uh, a group said in England said, we have figured out how much it costs to keep a person in jail every year. And we, therefore, are going to propose that what, uh, it was around recidivism, that basically when somebody gets out of jail uh, and then they go back in within two years, what that's going to cost the taxpayer. So they went to the government and said, basically, we think that we can keep, that we can reduce that recidivism rate. And what we're proposing with you is a contract that essentially it will cost us, if it costs you $100,000 a year to have that person in jail, we want you to contract with us for $10,000 a year to keep them out of jail. And in a sense, they've gotten government contracts to address the gap of funding, and the government saves a huge amount of money. Then I'm not explaining this well, but they, ultimately what they're trying to do is they're trying to offset their expenses by contracting with for-profit entities to save them money that they are normally spending for purposes that they can address. Does that make any sense at all? Okay, <laughs> Sarah, you're good to say yes on this because I'm so bad about explaining this, but it's really a compelling model about if we thought about that in terms, for example, which I think is an arts organization, the easier answer would be arts education. We know that, that some of the greatest factors that lead to or one of the highest predictors of, life in, or of a significant time in incarceration is the failure to graduate from high school. We could make the case that one of the major factors leading to retention in schools is arts programming. And if we wanted to propose a way, if we could figure out a way to articulate that by supporting arts programming, we're keeping people out of jail, and that part of the money currently being spent on incarceration could be diverted to keeping people out of jail through the arts, there might be new funding streams that could be created. There were speakers at the TED conference that addressed this last year in a compelling way, and this model is just starting to take off in the United States, not as far as I'm aware in the arts program yet, but in certain other social sectors. So again, it's a kind of hybrid model of how do we think above and beyond just traditional 501c3 models. These are really for-profit, non-profit partnerships that are designed to sort of address major social needs. Indeed. Um, social enterprise. Yes. Thank you. Is that the term you were looking for? Yeah, yeah, and there's another, there, there's a, a, there's a, like a, some, like a social bond contract, social oh, enterprise yeah. contract. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just not grabbing it, but bond. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and then B Corps, of course, um, it's kind of the stamp of approval saying um, there's more than just a profit margin, right? There's, there's people, what's the people margin? Uh, what's the environmental impact, all of these kinds of things. So triple bottom line versus just the for-profit money line. Yeah. And, you, know, yeah. you know, the other thing I would say is, at least in the national mm -hmm. community of arts grant makers, the dominant emergent new discussion has been on long-term capitalization of arts organizations and the growing awareness that we have an undercapitalized industry and that arts funders themselves are to blame. That in a sense, to some degree, we've always told groups you can only budget to zero, you can't turn a profit, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, we, we've encouraged a poverty mentality that we're now reaping the benefits for. There's a big move to get people now to uh, uh, to, to budget more accurately according to real needs rather than to try to reduce those kinds of uh, uh, needs or mask those needs. Uh, and additionally, I think that more and more funders are saying to grantees or potential grantees, let's not focus on your statement of activities. Let's look at your balance sheet. Let's look at the balance sheet in your audit, not out of or these positive numbers or negative numbers, but if we accept the premise that more, that a stronger balance sheet means more artistic freedom, which it does, that you cannot have a big play, you cannot take on a risky play, if you're hemorrhaging red ink, the stronger your balance sheet, the more artistic freedom you have. How do we work together to develop a stronger balance sheet so you will have more artistic freedom? Many of those conversations are now starting to begin with grant makers saying to organizations especially, you walk me through your balance sheet. You tell me where you think your balance sheet needs improvement and what your primary needs are. And so again, back to the advice, I would say one of the 
increasingly important things to do is make sure you understand your own finances deeply and that you seize that opportunity to understand what your balance sheet needs and you can walk it through. Because I think a lot of grant makers now are willing to be responsive to that, that question about what we can do to improve our long-term financial capacity above and beyond a short-term project. And again, if you don't understand your long-term needs, that's a huge missed opportunity. Absolutely. Again, sound advice. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, I know I, I want to just do a, a quick um, demo, and this is going to kind of pick back up on a, a thread that you initiated earlier around national arts funders and how um, they're, they're dwindling, if you will, and you feel like mm -hmm. you're one of the last few. Um, there's a way to do some research around national arts funders or just to find um, arts funders in your, that are funding uh, communities in your state, for example. And one way you do that is just using um, our comprehensive tool, the Foundation Director Online. And I'm just going to, this is going to be a brief jog in your screen. And I will um, quickly just bring up a web application. And so it should be coming up very soon for you. And maybe some of you have used this tool before. It's, again, it's called the Foundation Director Online. There's well over 120,000 foundations in it. Lots of ways to get to where you need to go. But for example, I'm going to, I'm going to use the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation as an example. Um, uh, and I'll show you their profile in a second. But one way I would get to it is by clicking on View Index. This is just one way to search o over 120,000 grant makers in their funding areas. For example, of course, if we'd want to look for arts funders, one way we could do that is just by scrolling through the A's. And again, I, to get there, I just clicked on View Index under Fields of Interest. I'm scrolling through the A's, and I see there's arts. There's lots of different ways that we itemize arts, arts councils, arts education that goes on. If I wanted to hone in on performing arts, well, then I would go back up here and click on P for performing arts to get there quicker um, and just kind of have a, you know, a more targeted search. So I'm going to click on performing arts. And it shows me that there's a 1,400 um, foundations that have said, hey, we, we fund performing arts. And then to narrow that and just look at national performing arts funders, well, then I would click on uh, View Index under Geographic Focus and click on National. And then this is, again, a very rudimentary search, but it's, it's going to you know, do exactly what we're saying it should do please bring back any national performing arts funders. One thing I could do in the uh, beginning here at the very bottom is click on um, this, select this box, which would exclude grant makers that don't have an open application process. Um, so we'll really kind of pare down our search that way. And we come up with a little over 100. In the upper left-hand corner, you can see um, the, the number of results and just a snapshot of our search. And as I scroll down, the grant makers uh, display alphabetically by name. And I'm just going to scroll down a little bit here. We've seen a few names that have been thrown out today, uh, Creative Capital Foundation, um, Dance USA. And I will just click on uh, the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation as an example. Uh, and this is, a, this is uh, an example of some of the information we collect, collect on funders. And you'll see their contact details, their website, of course, um, assets, and their, their total giving. And as we found out from Ben, the arts portfolio has a little over $13 million that's distributed every year. A little bit of background information on uh, Doris Duke. And then as we scroll down, again, more purpose and activities. And I went ahead and created this as a PDF and made it available as a handout in our, in our um, platform, our, our webinar platform. So you can download this. But I just wanted to share with you different ways that you can do a search and come across more funding opportunities as well. There's a lot to get to here. We have webinars every month on how to search the database. Um, and for you guys showing up today, I'm going to go back. Sorry, I'm going to go back to our original PowerPoint. For um, for you guys attending today, you actually can um, receive a discount because this is a subscription tool. Um, although you can use it for free in a lot of our partner libraries and locations. If you're in our New York, uh, Cleveland, San Francisco, or Atlanta or Washington, D.C. areas, you can come to our libraries and use it for free. Um, if you wanted to use this tool on your home or office computer, you can purchase it. And because you showed up today, you get a big discount. So go ahead and um, take advantage of that uh, to mid-November. And then lastly, for more information, um, you can uh, visit the arts program page on the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation's website. Um, I went ahead and put up the phone number for your office, Ben. I hope that's okay. Sure. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then, of course, 
please join us for other Funding for Arts Month um, programs. Any last wrap-up words at all, Ben? No, you know, the only other thing I'd say, which, which uh, I, I know the list can be somewhat overwhelming, and, and uh, um, uh, even though we're starting, and I think the search mechanism is great, one thing we often say to folks is when they're especially starting out is, are, do you have uh, uh, peer uh, organizations that, or, or sister organizations that you feel do the same kind of work that you do or have the same kind of reach that you reach or whatever, one easy way to begin to think about funding is to look at who their donors are. Uh, in rare cases, some of the giving, occasionally you will see, and it is true, that a trustee on a foundation board or a, a, a personal relationship might be able to leverage something in a program, and sometimes you'll see a huge foundation, and they gave a million dollars to the arts, and when you investigate, they gave one grant, and it was the whole million, and it was to an organization that somebody had a connection to. Uh, that notwithstanding, generally that's a good place to begin a shopping list to hone your investigation a little further, if, if a sister organization has a healthy roster of funders, that may be an indicator that maybe there's a receptivity to the kind of work you're doing as well. Absolutely.